This is chapter three in which we're going to add our obstacles. Now, there's one thing about our particular game design, which I asked you to think about in the beginning of the book, which is what needs to move. And the way that I'm going to build this game is I'm going to make the pipes move past the camera view and then jump back to a starting point off camera. And I'm going to reuse the same few pipes over and over again. I could, of course, make the bird move to the right through an infinite series of pipes, or maybe we decide that the high score for a level to graduate the level is 50 points or 100 points. The reason I'm not doing that is if I want this kind of infinite gameplay to the level, sooner or later, I'm going to run out of playable terrain. Even if I choose a giant 16 kilometers, which creates a huge burden on the engine with the 16 kilometer height map, I'm going to run out of space. And I also have to deal with anything that I may see behind my objects, not to mention having to create an infinite number of pipes or doing more complicated mathematics in terms of resetting the pipes to a constantly changing start position. So to keep things as simple as possible, I'm just going to freeze the position on X and Y. The bird is only going to go up and down, and the pipes are what's going to move. But of course we have to construct some kind of an illusion so the player feels like it's the bird that's moving. So let me go with the G key to find my bird, and I'm going to kind of pull my camera to the right here, and I'm going to go ahead and add my first obstacle. We're going to continue using our rigid body X, which was under the physics group. So remember that when you place an object on the terrain, it snaps to the terrain, and the default model is just the sphere. So the first thing we want to do is replace this model with a pipe that we've supplied to you, and that's in the objects folder. So if we go and find model property right here, click on the browse button. I'm going to make this window a bit bigger, but make sure I can still see my bird. And I'll point out one thing about the organization of the folders here. The engine folder really doesn't contain many assets. In fact, almost nothing. That's again why I had you install Game SDK because there's so many fun things to play with in here. So we're interested in the objects folder. So I'm going to close my materials. And if you look under props, Flappy Boyd, you're going to see a bunch of pipes. And the only thing I'll say about this is I would stay away from the ones that have transparency, like the grid, just because it complicates things a bit, and stay away from the ones that say large. You can certainly use the large ones, but the mathematics that you'll see in the course book are all going to change radically because those pipes are so much bigger. So I'm simply going to choose my pipe. Pipe Edgy is also a pretty good one that you could try using. And I click OK. We pull back a little bit. This thing doesn't look much like a pipe, but looks more like a donut. Well, why is that? If I move my camera down, you may have noticed by now that we get stopped by the terrain. And I'm kind of curious what, if anything, is going on below the terrain. In fact, if I use the Move tool and pull this up, I'll see that the rest of the pipe is actually hiding underneath the terrain. Well, if it, I get into a situation where I want to see under the terrain, I can turn off Camera Terrain Collisions in the Perspective Viewport's camera menu. And now I can go right through it and I can pull back and see there's a whole lot of pipe hiding underneath there, sticking way down into the water. So let's go ahead and position this. Remember that my flappy is at, at that easy to remember position, 500, 500, 100. So I'm just going to mathematically type in the position where I want my first obstacle to be. I'm going to go ahead and put him 15 meters away from the bird on the x-axis. I'm not going to make any change in the y-axis, so that's going to become the sort of line of my game movement. And of course, I'm going to put him at 100 meters on the z-axis. Click here, press the G key, and now I can start to sort of see the orientation my game is going to take. Now, of course, the distance between the bird and the pipes is going to affect how the game feels when it starts up. We'll fine tune those things later, and of course, you could do your own testing. Let's give it some kind of material other than this neon green. So, in the material property under general, I'm going to click on the browse button. And again, you can get creative and explore the many, many materials in Game SDK. I'm going to go for something in the generic folder because all the juicy stuff is in there. And I'm going to look for something concrete. I'm going to generate these thumbnails because for some reason they don't seem to be there. There we go. And I seem to remember there was something called tar paper, which was kind of cool looking. This one right here. Let's take a closer look at this. So there's my material. If I deselect it, I can see the texture looks pretty nice that the lighting is not really showing off these textures very well. The lighting results from two things. It results from your position on an imaginary planet Earth, 
and it results from the time of day. And all of this stuff is part of environment settings. So let's change these now and make our lighting a little bit better looking. If we go to the tools menu, we want to turn on environment editor. And it's a pretty big tool, so I'm going to dock it here in the same window as my flow graph. I'm going to move this up a bit like this so I can see it clearly. Make my in window a little bit bigger. The first thing you'll notice that there is a time scale here. It starts at zero and goes to 24. And as you can probably guess, that's just time of day. So right now we're at high noon. The other thing that's going to dramatically affect this is our position relative to the equator. And right now we are exactly at the equator. And as you may know, if you did a little geography, at the equator at high noon, the sun is directly overhead, which doesn't look very nice in terms of lighting. So the first thing I'm going to do is just try dragging this and it doesn't really matter where I put this, but given that I'm kind of going to put my camera on this side of my obstacles, you can see my camera here. So I'm going to be looking this way, and this is hopefully eventually going to become a bird. The face of the bird is going to face to the right, and I want to light that face. I don't want the face to be in darkness. So I'm going to orient this light so it doesn't put the face in shadow, but it sort of comes from the right. The next thing I'll play with is just time of day. So I can do something like this, and this is totally a creative decision. It's totally up to you. And now if I pull back, I can start to see the texture on the side of the pipe a lot better. Maybe I'll move this around even a bit more, something like that, and maybe make it a little bit higher in the sky. So I'm a lot happier with those settings. The lighting already looks better. Once you've got lighting that you like, let's go ahead and create our first obstacle by making a top pipe. We could go through this whole process again, but of course it's a lot faster to simply duplicate the pipe we already have and then just rotate it 180 degrees to create a gap that my flappy can fly through. What I'm going to do is simply copy and paste, but I'm just going to show you what I'm doing in the menu, Control C and Control V to paste. And I can see here I have another entity, but it's hard to tell because it's exactly on top of the previous one. So keep in mind when you paste something, it ends up exactly where the copy was. So what I want to do now is simply rotate it. I'm going to take my rotate tool, and I know I need to rotate exactly 180 degrees. That's going to be really hard to do manually, so I'm going to use snapping. And there are many kinds of snapping in the engine. We can turn on grid snapping to control movement. We can turn on rotational snapping, and we can even control our scaling. If you hold the mouse button down on one of these tools, we can set how much. I'm going to choose 45 degree increments and make sure that this is on. And now when I rotate about one of these two axes, I'm, it's going to make it very easy to rotate my pipe 180 degrees. Next, I want to move the pipe up. I'm not sure how much I'd have to experiment once I get the game really flying to see how big a gap is sort of playable. Obviously, the tighter the gap, the harder the game is going to be to play. Having looked at the scale of these pipes and already designed this game a couple hundred times, I know that I'm going to start off with an 8 meter gap between these pipes, but of course this is a part of the creative design of the game that you can try. I am going to turn on my grid snapping and I'm going to snap to 1 meter increments to make it really easy to move my pipe up exactly 8 meters, like so. Once you have your pipes into position, I want to come up with some sort of sensible naming scheme. I'm going to use this, pipe under one underscore bottom, because ultimately I know I'm going to have a bunch of these and I want them to sort in the right way. I want to put the each pair of pipes together. So I'm going to start off with pipe and then the number and then the word top or bottom. The other thing that I need to sort of complete my game is I need to score points. And the way that a point is scored in this game is simply that the bird successfully passes through this gap between the pipes without touching them. Well, right now I have nothing there to sense when that happens. So what I need is some kind of trigger. So I'm going to save. I'm going to go to my legacy entities. And I'm just going to search for the word trigger. And lo and behold, you'll see three of them. And it probably doesn't take too much thinking to guess that proximity trigger is what we're looking for. I'm going to double click this. And I'm going to use a little trick here, which is that instead of clicking anywhere and end up chasing down this proximity trigger way out here on the level, if you roll over an existing entity, your entity will snap to that particular entity. And that gets me pretty close to where I want it. Now I can turn this off if I need to, and I can just fine tune this position mathematically. I know I want it to be at 515 on X, 500 on Y, and dead center between the two at 100. 
Now you'll notice that I made a little mistake in my calculations. 100 meters is my vertical center of the game. It's just a random decision I made. But I need that to be where the gap is, which means both of these pipes need to move down. So an easy way for me to do this is turn on my grid snapping and simply move these down 8 meters. However, since this proximity trigger is in the way, it's hard for me to see this arrow. Here's a little trick. Go to this proximity trigger and simply hide it temporarily by clicking on this eyeball. Now I can select these two tools really easily and I can select my down arrow and move these both down 4 meters. Now if I show this again, I can see my score trigger is dead center between them at 100 meters. The next thing I want to do is affect the size of this. I want to make sure this entire gap is filled. I don't want it too thick because I don't want the player given a point until he sort of gets through this trigger. So I'm going to make it skinnier on the x-axis and taller on the z-axis. Now the funny thing is if you go and try and do this through scale, nothing is going to happen for a very simple reason. This is not a physical entity. It has no mesh. So scale has nothing to do with it. You have to come down here into Lua Properties into Dimension X, Y, and Z. And what I'm going to do is make this exactly 8 meters tall. And I'm going to make it quite skinny on the x-axis, just 1 meter. If you circle around, I'm using the A key, you'll notice that the width of my box is pretty much the same as the diameter of the pipes, which is about 5 meters. If you want to make the proximity trigger exactly the width of the box, again, you can't do it through the scale tool. You have to do it through here. So I'll make this slightly wider. So we've formed what is really comprises our first pipe assembly. These three objects together need to move together and the bird will try and dodge through this gap. Now because they need to move all at the same time, it would be a lot easier if they were somehow connected. So if I move the master, its children follow with it. And we're going to accomplish that through something called linking. Before I do that, I am going to give my proximity a trigger a name, score trigger 1. And to link, there's a couple ways to do this. I can select things here and use this link button up on the toolbar. But just to be sure of what the parent is going to be, I'm going to drag the children onto the parent. So I'm going to select my top pipe and my score trigger, and I'm going to drag them onto the bottom pipe. And you see this little plus icon, and when I let go of the mouse, they get indented, and now they are linked to the bottom pipe. I could have used the top pipe, or I could have even used the score trigger as the parent. It doesn't really matter. So now, I need to make a bunch more of these. I don't really know until I start creating my game mechanics and I fine tune my camera view how many of these I'm going to need, but I'm going to start off with four and see how it goes. I can either select all three of these at the same time in the Level Explorer or I can draw a window around them in the level. Just be careful when you get a more complex level because if you have entities that are way back here, even if they're invisible, they'll also get selected. So it's safer to select them from the Level Explorer. I'm going to do this mathematically. I've put a 15 meter gap between the bird and the first pipe. and I'm going to use the same 15 meter gap between each set of pipes. So I could either drag this or I could just do this by the numbers. Now I've noticed one thing, which is that I'm moving these pipes over on, in a positive direction on the x-axis, which is perfectly fine. However, I do remember that in the book, I moved them in the negative direction on the x-axis. And just to be consistent with the book and avoid confusion, I'm going to rotate and spin my whole game around like this. And I'm going to move this pipe minus 15, which would put this one at 470. So the orientation of my game is going to go this way. Again, it doesn't matter which way you make the movement travel. This is essentially a side scroller game with a fixed camera. But just to be consistent with the book that you already have, I'm going to work in this negative direction. So 500 on X. 485 on X and 470 on X. And you'll notice that all I had to do was move the bottom pipe and because the top pipe and the score trigger are linked to it, they automatically moved with it. Another thing I want to point out about linking, if you look at the position of the top pipe now, the bottom pipe says, hey, I'm at 470 on X, but the top pipe doesn't say that. It has a relative set of coordinates because it's linked to this object. So linked child objects show you positional data and rotation relative to their parent. So continue to do this to create two more sets of pipes. 
and I think I forgot to mention this, but to rename something, click on it once to select it, and then a second later, click on it a second time, and you'll be able to do it. Don't double click it, because double clicking it is the same as the G key, go to. So you have to leave a little gap in time between your clicks. So there's my complete set of pipe assemblies. This is a pretty useful view that I've created right now, and I might want to come back to it frequently as I'm moving around and creating other parts of the level. So there's a way to save views just in the editor. This has nothing to do with gameplay. And it's under the display menu, location, remember location. And you'll notice that the keyboard shortcuts are simply control F1 through F12. So we have 12 slots that we can remember and then go to later simply with control F1 through F12. So I'm going to assign this to the F1 key. So even if I zoom way, way out later on, if I press control F1, boom, I snap right back to that view. Pretty useful tool. That's the end of chapter three. In the next chapter, we're going to take a break from our obstacles and deal with creating some kind of game over section of the level.